Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, it's nice to have you all here today. Uh, this is Ahmed Zinedine. I, I'm the chairman of this poster session. And now we will do some checking for your equipment to check the sounds and the presentation. So I will call you in order, in order to check everything. So first, please, Tai Wei Fing, please open your mic and camera. Uh, okay. Uh, is there any? Uh, uh, did you hear my voice? Yeah, I can hear you. Please open your camera and rename yourself to your name, please. This one. Okay. Yeah. Uh, just uh, rename yourself, please. Oh, this one. Is uh, my poster shows only? Yeah, yeah, we can we can see it. Thank you, okay. thank you. The the next one will be Nan T Nigoyan. Is Nan T Nigoyan here? Okay, we'll move the, to the next one. Joshua Y10. Is Joshua here? Uh, you can stop sharing your screen, uh, Taiwan, I think, please. Seems like uh, Josh was not here also. So the next one is Tio T. Tran. Tio T. Tran. Oh, yes, I'm here. Okay. Uh, can please, you... Yeah, can you open your camera and try to share your screen? Okay. Can you see me? Yeah, we can see you. Thank Sorry, you. I can't share my screen. Wait, wait a moment, please. Uh, uh, Tai Wei Feng, please uh, stop sharing your screen. Yeah, we can share now. Okay, thank you. Do you see my screen? Yeah, we see. Thank you. Okay, thank you. The next uh, presenter, uh, Hang Tifa, Hang Tifi. I'm here. Uh, please uh, open your camera and try to share your screen. Okay. Can you see me? Yeah, we can see you. Thank you. Uh, now I I I can um share screen. Yeah, share share. Try to share your screen. Okay. Okay. Thank you, we can share it, thank you. Okay. The next uh, presenter, Shota Okazaki. Is the next uh, presenter here, Shota Okazaki. Okay. Mm. 
The next presenter is Emanuel Pilasi. Seems uh, that they are not here. Okay. Uh, the next presenter, Odontoya Dorch. Okay. Moving to the next one. We have Baharat Mershan Dani. Okay, the last one, how ding, is how ding here? Yeah, yeah. Can you uh, hear my voice? Yeah, I'm okay. Okay, I, I share my screen. Okay, is it? Yeah, okay, oh, we can okay. see. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, a few minutes and we will start. So I think now we can start with uh, our first presenter, Tai Wing Peng. Hello, this is poster number 48. 
And our research is try to evaluate the potential of beta cyclodextrin as a nanocyte carriers for the cation carriers. And also wanted to check the potential of the cyclodextrin as the drug carriers like to penetrate into the dentinal tubule. According to our previous studies, we already developed a novel strategy to carry the cation into the dentinal tubule as the occlusion agents. We developed some bioglass MSO plus silicus. But although our patent products could provide the deeper occlusion depths in shorter times, these products could only be applied under acidic conditions. The acidic con without the acidic conditions, the cation cannot release from the biomaterials, and the cation also cannot penetrate into the dentinal tubule. But the use of the acid will also harm the tooth. It will cause the demineralize and remineralize. Therefore, we try to streamline the other the novel biomaterial that could encapsulate the cation under the neutral conditions and penetrate into the dentinal tubule under the neutral conditions. So in this poster, we tried the cyclodextrin. It's a nature polymer with a low molecular weight. And this cyclodextrin is well used in the food industry as emulsion agents. And besides, the cyclodextrin could also provide the antibacterial effects according to its structure. It could inhibit the biofilm formation by the inhibitions of the chronosensings. So in figure one, we encapsulate the cation into the cation and the calcium into the biomaterial under different concentration, uh, con different pH conditions. So under the neutral in the AC conditions, the cation can be well encapsulated into the biomaterials with the equal concentration. And the figure two shows the morphology and the particle size of our biomaterials. These biomaterials are the nano size, the particle size around 200 nanometers. And the TEM result shows this biomaterial is a well suspended into water phase. And the figure three shows the in vitro calcium permeation profiles of our biomaterials. We apply our calcium content biomaterials on the human dentin slice and check the permeations. Uh, the result shows that oh, under the pH condition of the three, five, and seven, our biomaterial could penetrate and release the cation into the dentin, into the dentins. Although on the AC conditions, the, uh, the permeation shows the higher concentrations, but also on the neutral condition, it shows the relative low concentration. So our next step is to check the in vivo occlusions and the in vitro uh, in vivo occlusions. Well, that is my poster. Thank you. Thank you, Tawei, for your uh, presentation. Uh, now the floor is open for any questions. Anyone have any questions for Feng? Uh, I have a question myself, uh, Feng. Uh, did you uh, check the penetration depth of this material within the dentinal tubules? Uh, did you check the penetration depth of this material within the dentinal tubules after you have yeah. applied it? Uh, how long does it reach? Uh, after one hour, I can detect the calcium release and the permutations. Uh, yeah, how, how long, uh, the depths the dips from the base of the cavity to the bulb, how long does it reach? Uh, I think around 500 milliliters. Yeah, 500? No. Mm. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Now we have uh, here uh, Ho uh, Nan T. Negoyan from uh, uh, from uh, Ho Chi Minh City University. Yes, can you hear me yes. now? Yeah, uh, uh, please open your camera and uh, start. You have three minutes. Uh, sorry, I start camera, but it's not on. Uh, okay, okay, you can go go on, go on. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. Sh share your screen, please. Yeah. So my name is Quy Chuk Ngang, and I'm from Vietnam. 
Today, I want to present the poster with the topic Property of Two Endodontic Cellular and Individual Study. The chance of the teeth to completely heal and to be functional over time after endodontic treatment is more than 90%. So, that dentists prefer to choose endodontic treatment rather than tooth extraction. There are four clinical conditions affect the endodontic outcome. First, preoperative pre absence of periapical radiolucency. Second, root filling extending to one millimeter within the radius, radiographic apex. Third, root filling with no voice for satisfactory coronal restoration. The root filling with no voice is essential since it helps reduce the infection. In order, in order to gain better sealing ability, with the maker con must be used with endodontic sealer. Resin based sealer is considered as a standard for use in both clinical and treatments in and study. Calcium silicate based sealer is a, is a new material that has square sealing ability. The aim of this study was evaluate and compare for ratio of resin based sealer with for ratio of calcium silicate based sealer in root canal during operation with root maker con. In this study, a slicing machine was used to, in order to horizontally section sample within one millimeter thickness every slide. Our samples were photographed and by a digital camera and sterile microscope. For the methodology, 30 segmented molar remolars after cleaning, they went through endodontic procedure, including puppet assessing and canal shipping. After reparation, sample were divided into two groups. Group 1 teeth oper were operated with glutamate con and AF plus sealer. Group 2 teeth were operated with glutamate con and CRC sealer. After our sealer was set, teeth were put in resin mold and horizontally sectioned at 3 mm and 6 mm from apex. Other sections were photographed and picture were transferred to the computer. This is the picture of the canal from 3 mm and 6 mm from apex. For the result, voice ratio of resin bicellular at 3 meter were 4.012% and at 6 mm were 2.743%. Voice ratio of calcium silicate bicellular at 3 mm were 2.739% and 6 mm was 0.599%. Voice ratio at 3 mm at 6 mm from the apex. When using glutamate con with calcium basilic acidular were smaller than the canal when operated with glutamate con and resin basilic. There are no statistical difference between voyager of two cellular. PV were larger than 0 0.05 and my Whitney U test. In, in conclusion, the results were relevant to the third study of Setia et al. from 2014. Wang et al. from 2018 and Palan et al. from 2019. When operated with Utabekakon, the two endodontic sealers show similar sealing ability with coverage area higher than 95% at 3 mm and 6 mm from the apex. This is the end of my presentation. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Um, is there any questions? I have one question for you. The, did you try to standardize the diameter of all the canals of the used teeth in this study? Yes, all the section was standardized at the apex and move up to each millimeter. Oh, okay, thank you. Uh, now we are moving for the next uh, presenter. We have uh, Joshua Whitean from the National Dental Center, Singapore. Is uh, Joshua, you can start. You have three minutes. Hi, can everyone see my screen? Good afternoon. Thank you for tuning in to my poster presentation session. My name is Dr. Joshua Tan from Singapore. Today, I'd like to share with you about the accuracy of 3D printed crowns using a DLP printer. Digital light processing printers are increasingly used in dentistry. However, there is a lack of consensus on the recommended build angle and the effect of varying positions in the build platform 
has yet to be determined. This study aimed to investigate the effect of build angles and positions in the build platform on the accuracy of 3D printed single molar crowns using a DLP printer. The experiment is summarized in the flow chart. A lower right first molar crown prep was done on an ivorine tooth scan and an intraoral uh, scanner and digital crown was designed. In the pilot test, 15 crowns were printed in the middle of the view platform at 135 degrees. The crowns were scanned individually and each crown was compared to the original STL file it was printed from. The amount of deviation was quantified in terms of RMS values. RMS values between crowns were analyzed to determine how many crowns were required to be printed for the main experiment. In the pilot test, two, di two different independent variables for the main experiment were tested. There were build angles and positions in the build platform, which were standardized, as we can see in the two diagrams on the lower left half of the screen. Nine crowns were printed in each build platform, and this was re repeated three times for each of the nine build angles. In addition to RMS values, specific deviation values in terms of the X, Y, and Z axis were analyzed. These covered both integral and external surfaces of the crowns using 2D compare and simulated CMM measurement functions using a reverse engineering software called Geomagic's Control X. So the results from the experiment are as follows. The lowest RMS values were recorded at 210 degree build angles. This was around 27 microns. And the C2 position, which you can see on the bottom right hand side of the build platform here, which was about 29 microns. So simulated CMM analysis showed significant difference between accuracy of crowns at external finish lines across different build angles. Crowns orientated towards 90 degrees, as we can see here, like this, um, and 270 degrees, which are actually a mirror image of that, exhibited the greatest amount of deviation at the mesial and distal internal axial positions. The greatest amount of deviation at the external finish line occurred at 90 degrees and 270 degrees. This range from about negative 80 to about positive 80 microns. So in conclusion, the recommended build angles for printing a single molar crown are 150 degrees and 210 degrees. We found that position in the build platform did not affect the accuracy of crowns significantly at the external finish line. Thank you. I've come to the end of the presentation and will now take questions. Thank you for this nice presentation. And now if we have any questions, we can have them. Um, so, uh, is there any su suggestions you have for correcting this uh, amount of error related to the 90 degrees and 270 degrees, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, actually, my suggestion would be not to print at these two build angles. So, as this um, DLP printer, we have a diagram of it on the lower hand side of the screen. So actually this is the build platform, the blue thing that I'm pointing at, and it actually has a resin vet. So it's actually going upwards as the crown grows in size. So if we have 90 degree crown, right, there's actually a lot of resin that will get stuck at either the mesial or the distal aspect of it. So this is bad because the resin can't flow out. So we recommend actually tilting the crown a little bit off angle. So as it cures, right, the resin, which is pretty viscous, can actually flow out. So this would help to minimize the amount of error from, you know, the excess resin inside being cured. So we have a very tight margin, a tight fit of the crown. If we win at 90 degrees, we have to like core out quite a lot. So that's not good. Like. I wouldn't recommend doing that. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for that. Thank you. And now we have our next presenter, uh, Theo Titran uni from University of Medicine and Pharmacy at Ho Chi Minh City. Okay, can you see my screen? Yeah, we, we can see, we can start now. Thank you. Hello everyone, my name is Theo Chan. Uh, today, on behalf of co-authors and our supervisor, I would like to present a study title 
research and development of Vietnamese bifos. Uh, so firstly, as you know, maximum bifos is an important parameter to evaluate the functional status of the masticatory system and the effectiveness of dental restorations. So this work presented the fabrication and development of a novel, affordable, and accurate bifos meter and its application in measuring Vietnamese young adults maximum bifos. Our study was conducted in two phases. In laboratory phase, uh, our machine has been developed through four generations, and the final version contains the parting bars based on the strain gauge transducer to change the electrical resistance of the sensor from the applied force on the binding platform, and resistance change was then calculated and visualized using the digital processor display part. The device accuracy was then calibrated using Mohau Universal Calibration Machine. And when we had the model, we moved to the clinical phase. 36 adults, 18 males and 18 females, aged between 21 and 30 years old, with complete natural dentition, were measured the maximum by force at molar, premolar, and incisor on each side. Uh, so we, what did we have? Uh, the device had been fabricated with a 10 milliliter thick binding platform with two polytetrafluoroethylene layers and up to 700 Newton measurement range with 1% and 50% overload capacity and 1% allowable error of accuracy. Uh, here you can see the picture of the components of our device. And within two simple steps, uh, within 30 seconds, uh, you can use the device to measure the by maximum by force. Uh, so in the clinical phase, our study found that the mean of maximum by force among young adults were about 625 Newton, uh, 9, 5, 500 Newton and 161 Newton at the molar, premolar and incisor regions respectively. And uh, there was no maximum by force significant difference between left and right size as well as male and female. So in conclusion, uh, we try our best to be the first made in Vietnam by first meter and thanks to the university support. Uh, hopefully, uh, the, our device could be a potential device for dental profession in Vietnam. Meanwhile, more research is needed to improve this device both technically and clinically. So there is a lot of room for us to improve this device in the future. Uh, thank you for your kind attention. I would welcome any questions that you might have. Thank you for, for your nice presentation. Um, if there is any question, you can uh, just say them now. Uh, I want to ask you, um, did you compare this device to any other devices that used for the same purpose? Okay, of course, uh, you, uh, as you know, we have the T-scan system. Uh, so we uh, combine the, uh, the property of the measure, the maximum by force. Uh, uh, our device had a price of about 900 USD uh, compared to the T-scan system is from 10,000 to 90,000 uh, USDs. Uh, so because the expensive price, so in Vietnam, we, uh, we can't uh, for the T-scan system. So we just make this device to apply for our research and clinical use. Okay, thank you. I hope, I hope your device actually goes for more an international level and in the future. Thank you. Thank you, thank, you thank you very much. Thank you very much. Our next presenter, uh, Hang Tifei from uh, University of Medicine and Pharmacy at Ho Chi Minh City. I'm here. Yeah, you can start uh, now and share your screen, please. Let me share screen now. Okay. Can you see my presentation?
Yeah, you, we can see you, we can start. Oh, okay. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Phi Thị Hương. I am a student at the University of Medicine and Pharmacy at Ho Chi Minh City. It is my honor to be in this conference to present the research. My research titles the accuracy of internal scanner assay determination. Uh, now in the history, the evaluation and selection of sites are not of the most important factor to for assess uh, successful and highly aesthetic restoration. Therefore, the objective um, of this uh, study is to evaluate the shape matching function of two inter scanner, three shape just three and direct variable scan compared to a data spectral photometer. Beta is a safe five. So uh, the material and methods we use in this study are uh, firstly use student aids from 18 to 25 participated in this study. Participants must meet the inclusion and exclusion criteria. 20 tests of anterior and premolar tests of posture per participant were analyzed. A total of 600 tests with 1,800 positions were analyzed in this study. The shape matching was performed on the cervical, middle, and inside the third. And uh, shape matching results were recorded in Vita Classic, Vita 3D Master, and CIE Lab Value. Three such three and three prime scan CIE lab value were calculated from CIE lab, Vita Classic, and CIE lab 3D master conversion table. THE were calculated using CIE lab 1976 formula. The obtained data were statistically analyzed using SPNS 20.0 software. Uh, so the results and discussion on the way the couple were couple between each internal scanner and two sectors three shape matching results in both side table were in either slice agreement or disagreement following table one um color different value data equal calculated between each pair uh, there weren't any pair that satisfy the visual threshold um, mean data were value at all positions were above 20 in both Vita Classic and Vita 3D SAS guide following table two and table three. Um, using all the color value, weighted kappa were calculated between each inter scanner and with select frame uh, and to set just three set matching results. Uh, there was an agreement between calculate value at all position. So um, within the limit of the this study, the site determination uh, method of the two particular HR scanners, two set, two three and three primary scan are less accurate comparing to a data spectral parameter. Therefore, we recommend that the site um, matching result of two set, two three and three primary scan should not be used in clinician technician communication. Uh, where I cover the, all positions that I need um, to present today, I would try to thank you for your kind attention. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, are there any questions? Uh, I'm not exactly sure what your question. Please ask again. We we no. I just were uh, asking if anyone has any questions. Okay. Um, uh, but but do you think, in your opinion, that uh, these devices can be improved in the future and be can reliable with some modifications on their software? Mm, we um, we do statistically analyze with SPSS um, twelve twenty software. So I I think it might be best if you ask me after the meeting. Thank you. Uh, okay. Th thank you. Thank you. Uh, our next presenter, Chaota Okazaki from uh, Hiroshima University.
Um, can you hear my presentation? Yeah, we can hear you. Right. Oh, okay. Um, uh, I'm Shota Okazaki from Hiroshima University, Japan. Today, I'd like to talk about blood can help explainability of supermarity detection by deep learning. Can you hear my voice? Okay. Uh, I'm going to start by talking about introduction. Supernumerary teeth can occur in any part of dental us, but most commonly occur in premaxilla. Recently, deep learning has developed rapidly and shows potential for solving complicated medical tasks. In particular, analyzing medical images and detecting anom <clears throat> anomalies such as supernumerarities. However, deep learning has often been referred to as a non-interpretable black box because it is difficult to know the process by which it makes detection. Our objective is that to make the detection by deep learning more transparent and explainable. We examine the applicability of gradient-weighted class activation mapping called GRATCAM. GRATCAM is one of the methods that can visualize decision of deep learning-based convolutional neural network. Next, I'll talk about the method of our study. This study was approved by the Ethical Committee for Epidemiology of Hiroshima University. The total of 220 pa panoramatic radiograph images were revalidated and diagnosed by two expert pediatric dentists with supernumerary teeth as case group or no anomalies as control group. The number of case group images 120 and that of control group images 100. The supernumerary teeth contained in the data set were located in the region from maxillary midline to the incisors. To avoid deviation in the data set used to train model, a five-fold cross validation method was employed. The data set were randomly split into five groups. One group 20% of the old data set were used as test data set, while the remaining four groups were used as training data set. Using the data set, we trained three deep learning algorithms called AlexNet VGG16 and Inception V3. The diagnostic accuracy, precision, recall, F1 score, and area under the curve were calculated for evaluating diagnostic performance of the algorithms. Grant cam from the final composition layer was used to visually explain the future. Next, I'd like to talk about the result. The three CNN models achieve high values in each performance metric. And result of the analysis with the three CNN models shows that the feature visualization using grant cam with heat map identifies the location of the supernumerality. And this result suggests that the grad cam approach is potentially applicable to the diagnosis supernumerality. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for your nice presentation. Um, I think that the AI is now getting uh, spreading everywhere in our field, and uh, I think your your application is is very good actually, and uh, I hope to see it used widely in the future. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. <clears throat> um, for our next speaker, we have uh, uh, Emmanuel Pileski from uh, University of Minnesota. Hello. Hello. Can you, can, see, start? can you see my screen? No, you can. Uh, you still didn't share your screen. Okay, I I shared my screen. Yeah, now we can see you. Okay. Okay, you can start. Okay. Good evening, everyone. My name is Iman. I am a research scholar at the University of Minnesota. The title of my presentation is Carries Around Restorations and Marginal Adaptation of Iron Releasing Materials versus Resin Composite, a Systematic Review and Meta-Analysis of Randomized Clinical Trials. Despite significant improvement, in the resin composite formulation, the clinical problems of technique sensitivity, polymerization shrinkage, and lack of antibacterial properties remain the same. With secondary caries and, um, and bulk fracture remaining as the primary reasons of failure. 
The complexity of carries around restrictions arises from its multifactorial origin, combining the pathological pathway of primary carious lesions with the influence of different restorative material characteristics and formulations. Therefore, the aim of the systematic review and meta-analysis is to answer the following question. Is there a difference in the incidence of carries around restorations and marginal adaptation in iron-releasing restorations versus resin composites? Our electronic databases were searched via PubMed and Scopus. Gray literature was searched using Open Gray database and IADR abstracts from 2010 to 2020. The PICO question was as follows, population patients with permanent dentition, intervention, iron releasing restorations, comparison, a resin composite restoration with no specified adhesive system. Outcomes were secondary carries and marginal adaptation. Risk of bias was analyzed using Cochrane Risk of Bias tool, and the quality of evidence was assessed using the grading of recommendation assessment, development, and evaluation and criteria, uh, long for grades. 22 studies met the inclusion criteria, and 10 studies were included in the meta analysis with subgroups based on three follow up periods one year, 18 months to two years, and three years. Uh, the iron releasing materials that were used in this uh, systematic review were complement and GIC. There was no incidence of secondary carries in all follow up periods for complement, therefore, no meta analysis was conducted. As for GIC, the results of the meta analysis showed no significant difference between uh, the incidence of secondary carries in the in GIC versus resin composite. The short follow-up period, uh, as for the discussion and conclusion, the short follow-up period might have contributed to the overall low number of events. Findings of in vitro studies about the reduced incidence of secondary carries and iron releasing restorations is not consistent with the outcomes of clinical trials. Furthermore, the detection methods and criteria of evaluation might have played a role in reporting secondary carries. Patient factors could be more influential than the choice of materials. Within the limitation of this work, we can conclude that secondary carries is not dependent on the iron releasing capability of the certain material. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. And mm -hmm. um, I, I would like to comment on the conclusion here. Uh, so I think we can interpret it into another words like, it depended on the mechanical properties of the material, not its chemical composition actually to prevent the occurrence of new carious lesions. Yes, and it's also um, in the systematic review, it's a multifactorial process that is not primarily dependent on the, the iron releasing capability. Also, there are patient factors, operative factors. Uh, yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. Uh, did any one of the studies uh, try to measure any gap formations after the application of the materials? No, actually, the studies were clinical trials. So the clinical trials were using the either the FDI criteria or the USCHS criteria. So there was no direct correlation. They were not measuring uh, a direct correlation between the presence of gaps and the incidence of secondary carries. Okay. Is there any questions? Any other questions? Okay, uh, okay. Now, uh, thank you, Iman, again thank for you. your presentation. Uh, you. Now we invite our next presenter, uh, Odontoya Dori from Mongolian National University of Medical Sciences. Yeah, can you see my screen? Yeah, we can see your screen. Uh, you can start now. Okay. Good afternoon, uh, everyone. Uh, I'm Adun Dorj, uh, my PhD candidate at the Taipei Medical University of Taiwan. Uh, I'm going to uh, talk about the effect of opposing structure on marginal bone loss around non dental implants. Uh, as we can know, uh, the previous uh, publication, various opposing structure has been linked with changes in marginal bone levels around dental implants. And a retrospective uh, study uh, that reported that the, the bone gain uh, around implants that were opposing natural teeth 
uh, were observed while increased bone level was observed when implants opposed by implant supported restorations. On the other hand, a clinical study noted that uh, increased bone loss around implants that were opposing with uh, natural teeth as well as implant supported uh, restorations. However, implant, uh, implants opposing removable dentures showed less bone loss as compared to above mentioned uh, restorations. So uh, in our study, we would uh, like to see the effect of different opposing structure uh, on marginal bone level around non-submerged dental implants. So uh, in this study, we uh, included a complete denture, a fixed partial denture, uh, and removable partial denture as uh, opposing uh, structures. Uh, marginal bone levels were measured on the digital periapical radiographs at the medial and digit, uh, distal aspects of the implants. And uh, uh, a pair T test uh, and as well as uh, independent T test were uh, you know, used to examine the variables between and within the group. And uh, overall, uh, marginal bone low, uh, levels were uh, 0 0.8 millimeter at the baseline and uh, increased to 1.01 millimeter after 12 months. It was uh, uh, statistically significant. Also, uh, mean marginal bone levels for FBD were uh, increased after the uh, 12 month uh, observation. It was also aesthetically significant. And uh, well, marginal bone levels between uh, uh, complete denture and fixed uh, partial pr uh, prosthesis were different significantly at baseline, uh, baseline, and it was statistically significant. And also, um, now marginal bone levels uh, between uh, fixed partial denture and removable partial denture were differed at baseline as well as at uh, 12 months uh, after uh, prosthetic delivery. And um, also, we compared the change in marginal bone level from the baseline to the 12 month. Uh, were not significant in all opposing structures of the implants. However, uh, we uh, there were uh, the bone gain in implants op opposite uh, removable partial denture was observed in our study. So uh, within the limitation of the uh, study, uh, it can be uh, concluded that uh, the bone loss was greater uh, if non-submerged dental implants were opposed by uh, complete dentures and fixed partial dentures. Uh, marginal bone uh, level gain were observed if non dental implants were opposed by removable partial denture after 12 months observation. And thank you so much for your kind attention. Th thank you for your presentation. And now if anyone have any questions, please uh, come forward. Uh, may I ask you, um, is uh, the material of the implant uh, feature itself plays a role in this? Uh, pardon? Uh, uh, could you please say that again? Is the material of the implant itself, the feature, the material it's made of, and if there is any surface pretreatment for it, play a role, in, can play a role in this? Uh, I see. Uh, in this, uh, uh, the, the study we did not include the surface treatment, uh, but uh, this is the ITI stromany implant. And so uh, it is uh, the surface treatment, uh, uh, um, the L uh, SLA treated, uh, but uh, in the future, we uh, would like to see the, uh, co uh, the comparison with the other uh, dental implant design. Okay, thank you for, for your answer. Thank you. Now we ask our next presenter uh, to be ready, Baharat Mehrishandani from uh, Tamathat University. Yeah, hello, uh, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Uh, can, can you see my slide? Yeah, yeah, we can see. You, you can start now. So thank you, IADR, for giving me this opportunity to present my poster. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, today, I would like to present our in vitro study, uh, which was done to evaluate the effect of aging on surface roughness, tensile bond strength, and viscoelastic behavior 
of two materials which we use in our at our department a dynamic impression liner and peri resin tool these are two materials which we frequently use at our department dil or dynamic impression liner is a tissue conditioner which acts as a tissue conditioner first and then automatically begins self curing after a week of patient's wear so that patient feels comfortable and painless peri resin 2 is a resin material for peripheral sealing and extension of denture so for materials and methods we prepare both the materials according to manufacturer's instructions the sample specimens were divided into three groups n is equal to 5 according to the accelerated aging cycles of 0 1000 and 2000 thermal cycles the number of cycles simulated short and prolonged clinical use the thermocycling was performed for 30 seconds with alternated baths in water at 5 degree and 55 degree celsius later the surface rough roughness was measured with prolifometer and the tensile bond strength was used was measured with universal testing machine whereas the viscoelastic behavior was studied using advanced rheometer system the average and the standard deviations were calculated for each groups and the results were submitted to independent t test and one way anova test significant differences were compared by the takis method with alpha is equal to 0.05 for the results the dynamic impression liner exhibited a significant increase in uh, the sur surface roughness before and after thermocycling from 0.04 microns at baseline to 0.06 microns at 1000 cycles and 0.08 microns after 2000 cycles the the, the peri resin too also showed an increase in roughness from 0.02 microns to 0.029 microns however the difference was not significant the tensile bond strength of dil significantly increased after thermocycling from 8.63 megapascal to 21.6 megapascal whereas it decreased significantly from 26.62 megapascal to 17.24 megapascal for the peri resin 2 now for the viscoelastic behavior both materials demonstrated an increase in storage modulus loss modulus and even the loss tangent after thermocycling however the storage modulus and the loss modulus of peri resin 2 was higher than the dil and also it was noted the dynamic viscoelasticity of dil was more sensitive to changes in frequency than the peri resin 2 it was also found out that dil was more thixotrophic than the peri resin 2 therefore within the limitation of this study we can conclude that thermocycling significantly affected the physical properties of the denture liners however they remained under the clinical limit both materials exhibited viscoelastic behavior and dil had more marked changes in properties over time than the peri resin 2 thank you i would welcome some questions thank you for for your presentation and uh, i have a question uh, Do you recommend any other testing methods than the thermocycling for testing of these materials? Uh, so what what we did was we used uh, we used alternative uh, water baths from one to fifty five degrees. However, there has been some studies done in which they uh, they used uh, uh, a stimulated body fluid, and they also uh, used some uh, mechanical uh, devices like a brush. to stimulate uh, the aging process okay thank you uh, any Hello. any questions yes yeah, we have a question Can you hear me? yeah yes uh, thank you for uh, the presentation i have a question uh, how uh, how do you uh, calculate the thermal cycle compared to the, the clinical i mean can you explain for the thermal cycle that you used is for how long the aging factor Can you uh, get my question? Yeah. Uh, yes, I I get your question now. Uh, so how we, how you simplify the aging duration in the, in this research? Uh, we we simplified by by using one of the techniques which has been done before, 
by using it in water bath with alternative alternative temperature cyclings however there are, there are many methods in which you can simplify thermocycling depending on the availability of the materials and instrument at at your department yes i mean in the study so how long how long did you can you tell how long in this study like 10 years or 5 years with this the method that you use now so what what we assume what we assumed and uh, we found out from previous studies was the thousand thermal cycles it represents it represents one month of use of clinical use one month yes okay thank you thank you for your question Uh, can you see my screen? Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Ahmed Zainuddin uh, from the University of Hong Kong. And today's uh, poster title is Effect of Silver Diamine Fluoride on a Vital Dental Bulb a Systematic Review. Silver Diamine Fluoride is a non invasive treatment that is widely used for the management of dental caries. As a topical fluoride solution, it contains a high concentration of fluoride and silver ions. The application of SDF onto moderately cavitated caries or more advanced deep caries could induce a response from the dental bulb complex of the teeth. However, the effects of SDF on vital dental bulb are not clear. The aim of this review was to evaluate the dental bulb response to SDF when applied as a cabbing agent, either direct or indirect. The review was conducted according to the PRISMA guidelines. It includes in vitro and in vivo studies that assist the dental pulp responses to silver diamine fluoride using histological and immunohistochemical approaches. The literature was searched, was performed in four databases to identify the eligible studies. And you can see the search process in, in the figure here. The results of the included studies were assessed using at least one of the following outcome measures. First one was biocompatibility. The indirect application of SDF resulted in an increased cellular activity of the odontoplast layer beneath it, which was marked by the incremental line of Owen, while the direct application, even in a diluted concentration, resulted in pulp necrosis and increased cellular viability. Second outcome was the inflammation. The inflammatory response to indirect application of SDF ranged from mild to none, while direct application resulted in a separative inflammation, cellular infiltration, and hyperemia. The third outcome was odontogenesis. Tertiary dentin formation was observed in all of the teeth where SDF was indirectly applied. However, the thickness and the quality of the formed dentin was not mentioned. In addition, cuboidal odontoplasts with dense pisovalic nuclei were found entrapped within the newly formed tertiary dentin, and this can be considered as a result of the rapid deposition of the tertiary dentin. The fourth outcome is silver penetration. Uh, none of the included studies reported the penetration of silver ions into the pulp chamber after indirect SDF application. However, silver deposits were found to penetrate to the dentinal tubules, reaching a depth of one millimeter. The last outcome is bactericidal effect. Bacteria were not found inside the bulb chamber after indirect application of SDF, and dead microorganisms were found within the dentinal tubules close to the bulb, marking the strong antibacterial effect of SDF. Conclusion, the indirect application of SDF as a cabbing agent is safe and it increases the cellular activity leading to tertiary dentin formation, while direct SDF application is not recommended as it causes pulp severe inflammation and bulbal necrosis. For the future directions, studies with robust designs and precise quantitative and qualitative tests are required to gain a deeper understanding of the biological effects of SDF on dental bulb. Thank you, everyone. If there's any question, please feel free to ask. Hi, thank you for the presentation. I do have a question to ask. Is there a minimum amount of dentin that is required in order to this avoid the palpable inflammation? Did the studies actually measure like how much dentin do you need to have left? Thank you. Uh, 
the evidence are really scarce on this item, but uh, if it goes less than 0.5 millimeter, uh, you can have a uh, inflammation and uh, sometimes the silver can reach the bulb, but as long as you maintain at least 0.5 millimeters of remaining dentine thickness, you will be in safe while you are using the silver diamine fluoride. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, yeah, we have Howding. Yeah. Hello, yeah, can, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, we can hear you. We can start. Okay, so hello, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Hao Ding from uh, the University of Hong Kong. And I'm, today I will share with you about my research, which will be uh, the uh, 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 dental crown design by an artificial intelligence method. So uh, computer aided design and uh, manufacturing has been advocated to improve the traditional workflow for uh, dental crown design. However, uh, it encounters problems such as lack of accuracy and uh, expensive and still need experienced people to operate. Uh, so a fully automatic algorithm for uh, dental crown design by utilizing AI technology was presented in this study. Um, so we composed a 3D generative adversarial network, uh, 3D JAN in this study uh, because of the time limit. I won't go into details about the algorithm. So we have used uh, uh, 500 sets of uh, training data to train the network. The uh, Sorry, the adjacent T's um, were used as the input and the, the crown can be, generate, uh, can be generated based on the given information. And here are some of the results. And the, way, the, the quality of the uh, GAN generated crowns were evaluated by uh, several means such as cusp angle, uh, 3D discrepancy, and the crucial contact point area and the contact point number. Um, and the results shows, showed the discrepancy between the AI designed crown and the, the natural tools was low. Uh, the, the RMS uh, uh, root mean square uh, uh, is uh, 0 point, around 0 0.36 millimeter. So uh, the discrepancy is very low. And uh, 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 about the, the uh, contact point number and contact point area and uh, uh, the cusp angle, there are no, no significant difference uh, among the two groups. Um, so from this preliminary results, we may conclude that the AI design crown is comparable with those of natural tools. So, and our approach learns from the natural tools morphology, which is different from the current available CAD design or the design by technician. So this, I think this might be a more desirable approach in the crown design process. However, um, and it's, actually it's difficult to evaluate which crown design is better in vitro. The patient, the, the clinical trial is the, I think is a way uh, to, to evaluate the, the which design is really better. So our next step would be the clinical trial on the, this new design method. Uh, so this is my sharing. Any questions? Thank you for your presentation. Thank you. Uh, I have uh, one question. Um, uh, you, can this process be used to design a longer span bridge or oh. now just for single crowns? Now just for a single crown, but, but uh, yeah. Uh, okay, thank you. Are there any questions? Yes, I do have. Mm, is it a novel, uh, uh, the program to design a the dental crown or by uh, uh, the uh, 
created by you or the other? Yeah, I think uh, actually this uh, project is uh, I'm doing it uh, where we are uh, cooperating with uh, the computer science department and the way we we created this this uh, oh. uh, yes this uh, algorithm. Mm -hmm. That's great. Thank you. Any more questions? If we have, if we still have time for one more question. Yeah, one, one more question. We, okay, so uh, thank you for the very nice presentation. Very interesting, tidy and uh, timely in this digital era. Mm -hmm. So uh, from this study, how will you expand, uh, expand the, this research? Because it's also difficult, right, to make the AI working because to so make one photo as, as far as my understanding, we need a lot of like 10,000 photos to make the AI, AI can work. So how can you uh, uh, reach that, that uh, uh, this uh, result now? Yes, well, we actually, we, we collected the, uh, around five or 600 uh, samples um, from the healthy people, from the, actually from the uh, bachelor students in our faculty. And uh, uh, there are, um, Currently, this uh, it, it, uh, the, the, the samples are enough for, for our algorithm, but I think more, more, uh, more samples will be better. Uh, I think, yes, yeah. we, we, we will have still need to collect more, more uh, cases. Uh, yes, maybe. more photos for more, to make it more precise, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you. Very nice uh, for study. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for your participation today. Um, I wish everyone good luck uh, if you're competing for any prizes with your presentation. And this will conclude uh, our session today for this poster. Thank you all again.